Hello fellow Homer friends, Killer B here with another video on understanding railroads. Have you ever wondered how all these cars know where to go? Well that's what this video will be about. I spent 14 of my 41 years of railroading in car management with three railroads. So instead of just describing the mechanics of the job, I am going to intersperse it with history, stories, and examples that I think will leave you with a good feel for how it all works. So, loaded cars have destinations. In pre-computer days, when a customer had finished loading a car, they would submit a bill of lading to the railroad from which a movement way bill was prepared. This paperwork moved with the car. Nowadays, the shipper goes online to the railroad's website and enters the billing information. Empty private cars, those cars controlled by parties other than railroads and whose reporting marks end in X, with the exception of the TTX car fleet, automatically return back to their last loading point in reverse of loaded move. Unless different instructions are furnished to the terminating railroad, when the car is made empty. So that leaves empty railroad marked cars. How do they know where to go? Well, railroads have car management staffs whose job it is to oversee the rail car fleets and ensure the empty cars are in the right place and at the right time to fill car orders and manage any surpluses. In the old days, the job was called a car distributor when I started at CNW in 1981, it was all done manually. An article in a 1982 CNW employee magazine highlighting the equipment management department laid out the car ordering flow then. Agents received car orders from their customers and if they did not have enough cars on hand locally, passed them on to the divisional car distributors. Railroads are divided into operating divisions, who either filled the orders with available equipment on their division or asked for help from the headquarters staff in Chicago. Agents having cars making empty would report them to their divisional car distributor for disposition. They would match it up with an order for a similar car on their division or, if not needed, get instructions from Chicago where to send it. Empty railroad cars of foreign ownership not needed for reloading would be disposed of. One had to know how to apply the car service rules, which dictated how to return them. Computerization of the car management functions made productivity gains. Car fleet managers direct cars from areas of supply to areas of need using a car management system. Cars are generated from industries releasing them empty, from being received in interchange from other railroads, and from being released off of repair tracks. Usually all the railroad cars used on line, that is all the system cars, plus any foreign cars assigned on the property for loading, will be in pools. Here, Pool means a group of cars in the computer that have similar characteristics. For instance, in one pool may be all the 50-foot, 100-ton cushioned underframe boxcars with a 10-foot sliding door and a 10-foot 6-inch inside height. They do not have a home location. They are pooled together for the purpose of controlling them. Or they might be all the cars dedicated to a specific customer. That is the case shown here on an old Seaboard Coastline equipment assignment book. You'll see that all the cars in pool number 807-8500 are assigned to Schlitz at Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And all the cars in pool 807-2500 are assigned to Schlitz at Hillsboro, Florida for loading. The next piece of the puzzle is flow orders, or control orders. These tell the computer where to send the empty cars, and often they key off of the pool number. Shown here is a 1998 listing from Wisconsin Central 
of 23 Union Pacific covered hoppers assigned to Francis Creek, Wisconsin for lime loading. Two flow orders basically say that if you are a car in pool C3054 and an event occurs reporting you empty, then go to Francis Creek. The empty car now shows a destination in the system of Francis Creek and is handled accordingly. Having cars in pools makes it easy to monitor them. You can quickly glance at the pool detail. Let's see, all the empties are going to Francis Creek. All the loads came out of Francis Creek and are going to Granite City. And I know about these cars. Oh, everything's good. Usually a car management system will have multiple levels of orders. So flow orders, that is, car orders that flow cars, of a higher level will override flow orders of a lower level. It is up to each individual railroad how to arrange this hierarchy to suit their needs. At CNW we had seven levels. Customer orders were level five and were live, that is, actively picking up cars. Level seven was kind of a catch-all. Any cars not getting picked off as they made their way down the hierarchy from level one to level six would hit level seven and usually be directed to a storage location. When you created a new flow order, what level to make it was just one of many parameters. You could specify one pool or have it draw from multiple pools. You could have it draw empty cars from just one station or the whole railroad. You could do so many a day or make it a one-time order with a set number of cars. Each large railroad has developed in-house their own car management system. Whenever there is a merger, this is one of the things to decide which system to use or some combination of the two. When I went from CNW to WC at startup in 1987, we used the system developed by Missouri Pacific, which was being marketed by then owner Union Pacific under its UP Tech subsidiary. The system has significantly less levels, and all the car orders from customers entered into the system by customer service were filled manually by us. None were live orders that picked up cars on their own. At first, we felt like we were going backwards. But we adapted. This was our first experience to car scheduling. Once we applied a car to an order and the new destination kicked in, the system would show you all the future scheduled moves through to placement or delivery offline. By its nature, this was a seven day a week job. On weekends, you really had to check things, at least once each day at some point. But you always had some amount of time. For instance, WC switched all the traffic received at Chicago, at Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. So as long as you caught cars before they got to Fond du Lac and the Yardmaster marked up how to switch the train, no harm was done. We continually were calling the yards and we had to make a last minute change. Hey, did you switch 41's train yet? Good, I need to make a change. Line 12 now goes to Nina. Thanks. Car distributors are a proud lot. Most people stay in the jobs seemingly forever, which is good because there is a seasonality to the car loadings and it takes a few years to figure it out. Embedded in your brain is all your car flows and a matrix of the railroad's train service. You know the blocking and schedules by memory. Operations calls you all the time to help them out by having you paper switch cars. You take calls from the field on the weekend while running errands and just rattle off by memory where to send the cars in question. You interact with the customers more than anybody else. And you start to refer to the fleet you manage as my cars. I always enjoyed it. I circled back in the car management at the class one about 15 years later and not much really had changed internally. Externally, with the shrinkage in the number of class one railroads, we interacted with other railroads significantly less, in fact hardly at all. 
At CNW, I knew many of my counterparts on most of the other larger railroads. We often supplied equipment to each other. For instance, we had several Green Giant vegetable packing plants located on us, and our own fleet of RBLs, the insulated boxcars with cushioned underframes and interior load divider doors for handling canned goods, was insufficient to handle the seasonal surge of business created by the pack at the harvest and the end of the growing season. So we would go to the connecting lines who participated in the business also and request cars from them in proportion to the amount of business they enjoyed. For a while you would see a whole menagerie of different railroads cars at the plants. On the flip side, Although we had no auto parts plants on our line, we had a whole fleet of 50-foot, 60-foot, and 86-foot auto parts boxcars that were assigned to the Grand Trunk Western, Conrail, and Chessie. This is because we enjoyed business coming from those parts plants on those roads to the Chevy assembly plant at Janesville, Wisconsin, and the Chrysler plant at Belvedere, Illinois. Now with railroads so much larger, their car fleets are larger, and they pretty much take care of their car needs 100%. A car fleet manager has to be good at anticipating. At the class one, there is a cutoff of noon on Wednesday for customers to enter their orders into the system for the following week. Late orders risked not being accepted. Many customers complained they could not plan this far ahead, so they would just guess. Even for orders that were accurate, Knowing on Wednesday for the following week might not be enough lead time for the fleet manager. He might have to have cars headed to the customer on Monday or Tuesday in order to get them there in time. So you would guess based on past experience. Or call up the customer and feel them out. Or divert cars away from someone else and then backfill. At CNW, when I was a boxcar manager, a move popped up requiring cars at the far west end of the railroad, somewhere in Wyoming, I think. Transit time was something like two weeks for getting cars out there. A bane to the fleet manager's existence was missed train connections. A customer might want five cars a day, and you have them all flowing quite nicely based on when car scheduling says they will get there. Then the yard misses a connection between trains, and now you have no cars for day three and 10 cars for day four. So now you have to do two things. You have to find replacement cars for day three and divert the five extra cars for day four. But you make it work, and you feel good about it when it's accomplished. A fact of life were dirty cars and cars rejected for loading. Sometimes the receiver would clean off his loading dock of debris and throw it all in your box car. The next guy to load it would find a surprise when he opened up the doors. Or gondolas with excessive dirt that built up over time. Or covered hoppers with some mystery product left in the car. The weirdest one I ever had was some giant rocks that were found in an empty gondola. I traced its empty moves, but never figured out just how it happened. Customers beating up cars were also an issue. Box cars could have holes punched in the roof from a forklift raising its lift inside the car. Or forklifts being used to slide reluctant doors would slip and punch a hole in the door or push the door off its track. Gondolas would have flooring sections pulled out. Covered hoppers would have broken top hatch covers or buggered up bottom outlet gates. And guess who the customer would call to tell this cheery news to? I had responsibility for the unit grain trains at one time. We had 25 car and 100 car unit trains. One grain shipper had its own fleet of covered hoppers, plus ordered 25 car units from us. I always had to watch where their cars were going so that I didn't send 25 of my cars to an elevator at the same time one of their units was going to the elevator. This was a guaranteed way to get an irate call from operations. Who would also get upset if all the cars didn't show up together and they dribbled in, requiring multiple stops to drop off cars? 
My reply was always, hey, talk to your brothers up line that split them up. They were all together when I billed them. Because you were usually in the job so long and usually enjoyed your customer interaction, you often developed a good relationship with your customers. So favors were often traded as you got to trust each other. For instance, once a grain customer had their 25 car set going to the same elevator, I needed to send my 25 car set to. I asked them if I rebuild their cars, could they just go to a different elevator? Eh, sure, no problem. Surplus cars were never fun. You would have to call around to the operations guys and try to find 50 to 100 car lengths of room somewhere to store cars. With railroads loving to remove unused side tracks and every yard track at a premium, it was harder than one would think. For me, a favorite part of the job was seeing a train go by and seeing in it a block of cars that you had sent. Well, hopefully you now understand how cars know where to go. It is the wizard behind the curtain. Thanks for watching. More to come. Bye for now.